I am back. Let us continue. Raise your hand if you're able to hear me clearly. All right. Um, question one. You have the answer to that question. Go ahead. B. B as in boy? Yeah. That's correct. Number two. What up, love? What up, love? Mute that mic. You Question want? number two. <laughs> Question number two. D. D as in dog? Yeah. Mm. D is correct. Question number three. D. D? Yes. Has too much blood glucose and not enough insulin? Hmm. Anybody yes, else have anything? It's answer, it's, it's answer B, as in what? I hear B. Trans yes. is what you, what you have. B as in boy. Mm. Yeah, B as in boy. As in of insulin, but not enough blood glucose. Okay. B is correct. All right. Now, let's go to the final chapter. For what is required for this course. All right. Chapter 18. So we, we're going to look at lifting and moving. And this will be the final chapter that we cover for the minimum requirements for EMR. The additional chapters will be made available to you. Um, you can cover those chapters in your free time if you so choose. Right? So it's going to be up to you to, if you want to cover the additional chapters. The chapters that I've covered over the past three days will be the ones that you're tested on. The additional chapters is for your personal development. And as I said, that's a choice. Now, lifting and moving. As EMS responders, we have to do a lot of lifting and we have to do a lot of moving. And to do that, there are some, some fundamental concepts that we must follow and execute so that the risk of injury is reduced. Introduction. As an EMR, you must analyze the emergency situation. You must quickly evaluate the patient's condition and carry out effective life-saving emergency medical procedures. These procedures may require you to lift, lift, move, and position patients. Now, general principles for lifting and moving. Every time you move a patient, keep these general guidelines in mind. Do not do no further harm to the patient, right? Move the patient only when it's necessary. Move the patient as little as possible. Move the patient's body as a unit. 
use proper lifting and moving techniques and there needs to be someone who gives command give commands now when it comes to lifting and moving if the patient weighs more or look as if they weigh more than your weight and your partner weight combined it means the toe owner can't lift that patient you're going to need additional resources we're not supermen. Also consider these recommendations. Delay moving the patient if possible until additional EMS personnel arrive. Treat the patient before moving, moving him or her unless the patient is unsafe. Do not step over the patient. Explain to the patient what you are doing. Move the patient as few times as possible. And you will always choose the technique that is easiest for you and put the least amount of stress on you and your team members. Now, with proper body mechanics, under no circumstances in EMS, we lift using the muscles in our back. So at no point we use our back muscles to lift anybody. We're lifting, the weight is supported by the legs. So know your own physical limitations. And at minimum, you should be able to, to carry your own body weight. And in EMS, you should be able to maneuver the stretcher with 250 pounds between you and your partner. Maintain a firm footing, keep your balance, lift and lower the patient by bending your legs, not your back. Try to keep your arms close to your body. So the closer your arms are to your body, the more strength, the more control. Once the, the arms become fully extended, they get weaker. Recovery position. Unconscious patients who have not suffered trauma should be placed in a side lying or recovery position once they have good chest rise. This helps keeps the airway open and allows secretions to drain from the mouth. Proper body mechanics, note the, the responder in the picture, how he's holding, he's using a power grip, palms up. Um, improper lifting or moving techniques can result in injury to you or the patient. Good body mechanics, use the strength of the large muscles in your legs to lift patients instead of using your back muscles. So what that means under no circumstances, you should be lifting a patient and your back is bent. So you should not bend your back to lift any patient. Keep your back straight as you lift. Lift without twisting your body. Don't let the weight pull you forward or push you back. Um, ensure that you have full control. So if you feel like you don't have a good grip, tell him, hey, I don't have a good grip. Hold on, hold on. Ensure that you have firm footing before you start to lift or move a patient. Assess the weight of the patient. And that can be unpredictable because some patients might look like they don't weigh a lot. And when you start to move, you're like, okay, what's going on? No. <laughs> If you cannot reach over your patient and touch the opposite side of the patient, you're probably going to need some, some assistance, right? So if you can't stretch over and touch the opposite side of the patient, you might need some help moving that patient. So know what your physical limitations are, right? If you know, say, you can't manage the upper part of the patient, don't take the upper part of the patient. And the strongest person should should maneuver the upper body of the patient. Call for additional personnel if needed. Communicate with other members 
of the lifting team, practice lifts and moves. All right, now our emergency move or emergency movement of patients. This is done when you have a situation in which there's a patient in a particular location, but there is something present in that location that is a danger to you, your crew and the patient. So you don't have time to do an assessment. You need to move that patient out of the location as soon as possible and then start an assessment. So that's what we call an emergency move. And in EMS, all drugs, so all drugs are emergency moves. Whether it's underarm drug, closed drug, firefighter drug, all drugs are emergency moves. So emergency movement of patients. Move a patient immediately in the following situations. Danger of fire, explosion, or structural collapse exists. Hazardous materials are present. The accident scene cannot be protected. It is otherwise impossible to gain access to other patients who need life-saving life care. So I may have to use a emergency move to move a patient that is not critical to get to a critical patient. A patient has experienced cardiac arrest, you need to move them quickly to a supine position where you can start CPR. So emergency drugs, you have the closed drug. Simplest way to move a patient, grasp the patient's clothing in the neck and shoulder area and rest the patient's head on your arms and drag patient out of danger right now this is going to be, depend on the type of clothing because some clothing rip easily so you have to think about that as well how thick is this clothing can i get a good grip on it don't tear can i get a good grip on it don't loosen up right so think about these things then you have the cardiac patient sorry cardiac patients and the closed drug if the room in which you find the patient is not large enough to move the patient, drag the patient from the tight space and quickly move furniture out of the way to provide CPR. Now the blanket drag, which is my ideal method. So I will either go for an underarm and that's if I can wrap my arms around the patient or I'll go for a blanket drug. Using this drug, use this drug if the patient is not dressed or is dressed in clothing that could tear easily. Place the rug on, on the floor and roll the patient onto it. Pull the patient to safety by dragging the rug. No. Naturally, if you have to put a blanket and lock roll a patient, it's going to take time. So again, you have to consider that in the based on the type of situation, right? The arm to arm drag, and that's my preferred method. The picture that is depict, depicted is not necessarily the way I do it, but um. <laughs> it follows the same principle. So I like to grab the opposite arms, right? So when I go under, I grab the opposite arm. It gives me better control of the patient's body. Place your hands under the patient's armpits from the back and grasp the patient's forearm. Use to move a heavy patient. Offer some protection for the head and neck. And then you have the firefighter drug. Um, tie the patient's wrist together, get down on your hands and knees and straddle the patient. Pass the patient's tied hands around your neck, straighten your arms and drag the patient across the floor. And this is for firefighters specifically. Now, 
outside of emergency, oh, we're still on emergency drugs. Emergency, emergency drug from a vehicle, um, the preferred method is a uh, underarm drug, but again, you have to be able to wrap your arms around that patient. One rescue grasps the patient under the arms and cradle the patient's head between your arms. Pull the patient down into a horizontal position as you ease him or her from the vehicle. And most of these techniques are specific to fire service, right? Um, because they are responsible for that type of rescue. That's the emergency drug. So that's a body um, drug, and it can be done in a way we have better control. My technique is a bit different. Now, two or more rescuers. One rescuer supports the patient's head and neck while the second rescuer moves the patient by lifting under the arms. The patient is removed with the head and neck stabilized in a neutral position using a long backboard if time permits. And this is more extrication, not something that I would be teaching you all. So that's extrication, putting on a C color or cervical color to keep the spine from shifting and putting a short board behind the patient and then pulling the patient out onto a long board. Not a technique or procedure that I will be covering for your training. If I was training firefighters, definitely they would have to go through that. All right, now non-emergent moves or non-emergency moves carries for non-ambulatory patients. So ways that you can carry patients that can't walk. You have the two person's extremity carry. Rescue one reaches under the patient's arm and grasps the patient's wrist. Wrist, sorry. Rescue two reaches around the legs and grasps the patient behind the knees. The two rescuers stand up and carry the patient away. You have the two person seat carry. The rescuers kneel on the opposite side of the patient, near, near the patient's hips. The rescuers raise the patient to a sitting position and link arms behind the patient's back. And the rescuers place other arm around the patient's knees and link with each other. No equipment is required. Can show you what that look like. So that's one way of doing it. There's another way where you can do it using the figure four technique. All right, cradle, cradling arms carry, used by one rescuer to carry a child. Kneel beside the patient and place one arm around the back and the other under the thighs and lift slightly and roll the child into hollow formed by your arms and chest. Two person chair carry. And if you're gonna carry a patient on a chair, you're gonna need to strap them down on that chair. Rescue one stands behind the seated patient and grasps the back of the chair. Rescue one tilts the chair backwards to the rescuer, to rescue two. Right, so one is one person is controlling the lower portion, another person is controlling the upper portion. The person at the, the head will always give the command. You have the pack strap carry back into the patient as he or she is standing, grasp the patient's wrist and cross the arms over your chest, pull the patient onto your back, bend forward to lift the patient, stand up, walk away. 
They have the direct ground lift, which you need at least three to four persons to perform. Used to move a patient who is on the ground or the floor to an ambulance stretcher. Should be used only for those patients who have not sustained a traumatic injury. All right, now transferring a patient from the bed to the stretcher. The stretcher has to be close to the bed. The ideal method is to use the sheet method or blanket. So you roll the, the, the sheet or blanket close to the patient and move the patient to the edge of the bed and then you move the patient onto the stretcher. So never stretch across to move the patient. So at no time when you're moving a patient, you should have a fully extend arm. Incremental movements will reduce risk of injury to you and your crew members. So we log roll the patient, roll that sheet as close to the patient as possible. Once we get it close to the patient, then we get the patient to the edge of the, the bed, and then we put the, the patient on the stretcher. Note how many rescuers are present. Four. You have the one person walking assist. Help the patient stand. Have the patient place one arm around your neck and hold the patient's wrist. Put your free arm around the patient's waist and help the patient to walk. You have a two person, person walking assist, useful if the patient cannot bear weight. The two rescuers completely support the patient. They have the, the stretcher, which is one of the primary equipment that we utilize in the pre-hospital setting. Right? So it's one of the most commonly used EMS devices, can be adjusted to various heights, or levels and it has traps to secure the patient. The it has a the sorry the head portion of the stretcher can be adjusted to from supine to semifolars or 45 degrees to 90 degrees. Stretches can be rolled or carried by two or four persons. Right? Now, once a patient is on the stretcher, when we're traveling with the stretcher, we travel foot first. So we pull it from the foot end and somebody push it from the, the top portion. So it travel, you travel with the patient on a stretcher in a way that they can see where they're going. When we're going to load the stretcher, the stretcher is load, um, secured into the ambulance the, the, at the head portion first. So the head portion goes into the ambulance and then it is secured. Stretchers can be rolled or carried by two or four, per, four people. If the surface is smooth, a wheel stretcher can be rolled with one person guiding the head and one person pulling the foot end. If the loaded stretcher must be carried, it is best to use four people, one on each, one on one at each corner. If the stretcher must be carried through a narrow area, only two people will fit. Now we have portable stretchers, and this is where we are not able to utilize or wheel stretchers, so we need a lighter one based on the type of terrain. Use when the wheel stretcher cannot be moved into a small space, small and lighter than the wheel stretcher, can be carried in the same ways that a wheel stretcher is carried. The only issue is you're gonna have to bear that weight a lot longer. If the patient is on a stretcher, you don't have to carry that weight around for a very long time. 
Now the steer chair, this is for moving a patient from upstairs, downstairs, if they are not able to, to walk effectively. Portable moving device that is used to carry a patient in a sitting position. It is useful for patients who are short of breath or who are more comfortable sitting. Small, lightweight, easy to carry. Do not use with patients who have experienced any type of trauma. So it's not for trauma patients. Bot boards. Used to immobilize patients who have neck or back injuries. Used to assist in lifting patients and immobilizing lower extremity injuries. The long back boards are used for moving patients who have experienced trauma and useful for lifting and moving patients who are in small spaces. And that's what it looks like. And in order to effectively use a backboard, you need at minimum four persons. Someone to control the head, someone to control the upper body, someone to control the legs, and somebody to position the spine board in the correct position. It's made of plastic or fiberglass. Patients must be secured with straps. If the patient has sustained back or neck injuries, the head should be immobilized. And then you have your short backboard devices. And the one that we're seeing in this picture is the Kendrick extrication device. It is used to immobilize the head and spine of a patient that is found in a sitting position that is stable, but they cannot move. Usually made of plastic, some consist of a vest-like garment that wraps around the patient. And then you have the valuable scoop stretcher or orthopedic stretcher. Scoop stretcher, stretcher, this is a stretcher that can be pulled apart and, play, and play a portion of it placed on either side of the patient. It's very useful for lifting patients that we cannot log roll or patients that might be heavy. Place one half on each side of the patient then attach the two halves together. Helpful when moving patients out of small spaces. Do not use for patients with head or spinal injury. Now, they, they do have a new orthopedic stretcher that is both, it has both orthopedic and backboard function. So it's actually a scoop backboard. And that one can be used for spinal injury patients. Now, in, in an emergency situation, use when it, sorry, in an emergency situation, use, it is necessary because it's wide, sturdy, um, Right, I'm not, I'm not sure what this slide is trying to say, but um, for the use of the spine board, we there, it's only utilized in the pre-hospital setting if we suspect possible spinal injury to the patient, or we need to get the patient quickly onto a flat surface that we need to do CPR. That, or the patient is heavy, or it's a patient that we cannot log roll. So one, we will use a spine board if we suspect there is spinal injury. That's one. Two, 
we, the BOP board can be utilized if we need to get the patient onto, onto a flat surface very quickly so that we can do chest compressions. The BOP board can be utilized when we are not able to, to log roll the patient and that would be the scoop BOP board, right? <clears throat> And it, we can use our back board if the patient is heavy or we need to move them. Now, treatment of patients with suspected head or spine injury. Anytime a patient has sustained a traumatic injury, suspect injury to the head, neck, or spine. Improper treatment can lead to permanent damage or paralysis. Keep the patient's head in a neutral position and immobilize. Keep the patient head straight. Now applying a cervical collar used to prevent excess movement of the head and neck. I have various types of cervical collars. You have soft cervical collars that do not provide sufficient support for trauma patients. So we do not utilize soft cervical colors in the EMS set settings. All of the C colors that are used are rigid in the pre-hospital setting. You will see persons with soft color that have um, rhinic or whiplash type injuries. And we will go through the skills in terms of how you would provide manual inline stabilization of the head, size the neck, and put on a C collar to secure the neck that you can place the patient on a spine board. That's a practical that we will go through as well. Um, patients who should be transported on a back board include any patient who has sustained spinal trauma in a motor vehicle crash or fall, any person who has sustained gunshot wounds to the trunk. If you suspect the patient has spinal injury, move the patient as a unit. Transport the patient face up, and that would be supine. Keep the patient's head and neck neutral or straight. Be sure that all rescuers understand what is to be done before attempting any movement. One rescuer gives command, and that is going to be the rescuer that is at the patient's head. We will be moving. We're going to log roll this patient on three. One, two, three. All right. <clears throat> um, assisting with short bot board device, not going to go through that. All right, log rolling, primary technique used to move a patient onto the long board. Requires a team of four rescuers. Movement technique of choice in patients with suspected spinal injury. Going to practice that face to face. All patient movement commands have two parts, a question and the order for movement. Move the patient as a unit, keep the patient's head in a neutral position at all times. Now, if it's a patient that we cannot log roll, we can do what is called a straddle lift. So let's say the patient has um, suspected spinal injury, but they have fractures on both sides of the body, so we can turn the patient. A straddle lift can be used to lift the patient up and slide up a spine board underneath the patient. So that's what we call a straddle lift. So five rescuers are needed for that one at the head and neck, one to straddle the shoulders and chest, one to straddle the hips and thighs, one to straddle the legs, and one to insert the backboard under the patient. The lift should be practiced often.
in the straddle slide, which um, is a little bit different, is the your, your a straddle lift is used to lift the patient to get the foot off the the spine board underneath the patient up all the way down to the lumbar region and then we slide the patient up on the board may be useful when the patient is in an extremely narrow space the rescuer's positions are the same lift the patient as a unit slide the patient forward about 10 inches at a time um, each rescuer should lean forward slightly and use a swinging motion to bring the patient onto the board. All right, now straps and strapping techniques. I have various straps, I have various strapping technique. Um, not something I'm going to spend a lot of time on. Right? If you have a backboard or stretcher, just be familiar with this type, the type of straps that are used and how the straps are, are um, connected. Because you have the, the X approach, I have the straight across approach with the straps. All right, so you have the straight across approach. I can use the X approach to secure the patient on the board. Patient must always be centered on the spine board before you secure the patient. Any space between the, the patient and the board must be filled. Head immobilization. The blanket roll is an improvised device that works well and is readily available. So if we don't have a commercial head immobilizer, like what you're seeing here in this picture, we can use a blanket to stabilize the, the head or immobilize the head. Head stabilization must be maintained through the entire procedure. So when we suspect spinal injury until the neck is secured and the patient is on a immobilization device, the head should be kept in the neutral position. Um, that is changing as we move forward, but for now, take that approach. All right, these are commercial head immobilizers. And that would be the end of the chapter. So the most important um, aspects of this chapter is the principles for lifting. You need proper distance between your legs. Your arms should not be fully extended. So the arms need to be close to the body. You want a power grip that's palm up. Um, if you... If the weight between you and your partner is less than the patient's body weight, you're gonna need assistance. Choose the best method, right? Choose the best method for your crew members, yourself and the patient. Um, <clears throat> the person at the head will always give commands. We do not live with, lift with our, our back muscles, we lift with the legs. Understand the difference between an emergency move and a non-urgent move. So emergency is when we don't have time to assess. Something is there that is a danger to us, the patient and crew members. So we need to move that patient quickly. Um, Non-emergency move, it mean your patient is stable so you can you have time to come up with the best method to really position this patient and get them to where they need to be so these are the, the fundamental principles a lot of the techniques and procedures that 
you observed in this chapter is very specific to EMS, EMR responders within the fire service. So a lot of it is heavily specific to them and not necessarily specific to you guys because you don't function unless you function as firefighters and firefighters run into danger, right? So a firefighter run into danger. EM, EMS professionals do not, right? So you have firefighters that are responsible for rescue operations. And you have firefighters that are responsible for EMS um, operations. As a firefighter that is responsible for um, the safety of property and, and livelihood or rescue operations, they run into danger. If the firefighter is functioning as an EMS responder, they do not put their personal life at risk. So the scene must be secured before they can interact with the patient. So in other words, a firefighter cannot carry out dual function. Right? So if, if there is an emergency situation, let's say there is a motor vehicle accident, there will be a rescue team from the fire service that is responsible for cutting the metal and creating access to the patient and making sure that it's safe for the firefighters that are responders to treat that patient and get the patient out of the vehicle. But they cannot um, carry out dual function. It's one or the other. Now, summary, general guidelines when moving patients do no further harm to the patient. Do no further harm. If you can't manage, you can't manage. Move the patient only when necessary. Move the patient as little as possible. Move the patient body as a unit. Use the most appropriate technique. Have one rescue commands when moving a patient. Unconscious patients who have not sustained trauma should be placed in the recovery position. If a patient is on the floor or ground during an emergency situation, you may have to drag the person away from the scene instead of trying to lift and carry the, the person. Do not lift or move a patient if you suspect a spinal injury unless it is necessary to remove the patient from a life-threatening situation. EMS services typically use wheeled ambulance stretchers, portable stretchers, steer chairs, long backboard, sharp backboard, scoop stretchers. Now, these equipments must be present on an ambulance. So these are legally required. So if you call for an ambulance and they don't have these equipment, that, but that can become a lawsuit for that company. A cervical collar prevents the excessive movement of the head and neck. Log rule, rolling is the primary technique used to move a patient onto a backboard. Once a patient has been secured to the backboard, the head and neck must be immobilized. And that would bring us to the end. Question one. Quickly. Body of an answer. Uh, go ahead. Okay, I hear A, that's correct. Number two.
player C. Anybody have anything different? Anybody have anything outside of C? B. B as in boy or D oh, as in dog? Dog. D would be correct. Number three, head immobilization. B. Higher B as in boy. Okay, let's see. That would be correct. All right. That brings us to the end. Now, the question.